Good afternoon, everybody. It's uh, great to have you here. Uh, today, Edelman launched its fifth annual Trust Barometer Special Report on Institutional Investors. So we're going to have a terrific panel today discussing the findings and some incredible panelists that are going to be debating. Um, today, we have with us Deborah Cafaro, who's Chairman and CEO of Ventos, Harlan Tuffert, Vice President of ESG Research at MSCI, Tanya Levy-Odom, who's Director of Investment Stewardship at BlackRock, and Katrina Dudley, Senior Vice President, Investment Strategist and Portfolio Manager at Franklin Templeton. And moderating the panel today is Simon Mundy, who's Moral Money Editor at the Financial Times. Um, before we get over to the panel, I thought that would be a good idea to provide a little bit of perspective and an abridged version of some of our findings. So we can pull up the presentation for a moment. So if we go to slide two. So this was our fifth year and we surveyed 700 institutional investors across seven global markets. And you can see that it is a really strong repre representation of the market. Um, some smaller funds, some mid-sized firms, and some larger funds. Next slide. Here are our key findings. So first, building ESG trust with investors is an uphill battle. And we'll talk a little bit more about that. Number two, investors are pushing for climate action. And there's an expectation from investors for a net zero plan. Number three, Employee empowerment builds investor trust. And we'll talk a little bit about what employee activism or how investors think about employee activism. Number four, traditional investors are engaging in activist tactics and hope we'll, I'm hopeful we'll have a nice dialogue around that. And then fifth, we couldn't have a survey of institutional investors without talking about what's happening from a retail investor, uh, from, the, from a retail investor point of view. Let me go to the next page. So let's start. First, investors scrutinize ESG as much as operational and financial factors. We started to see that in previous surveys, and certainly that was the case this year. 90% in the US believe that. Next slide. Investors, however, are questioning the accuracy of ESG disclosures. 82% believe that companies frequently overstate or exaggerate their ESG progress when disclosing results. 86% in the US. Next slide. Most investors, however, don't believe companies will achieve their ESG commitments. When we asked, I do not trust companies to achieve their stated sustainability, ESG, and DEI commitments. 62% in the US, 72% globally. Next slide. So investors are favoring mandatory ESG disclosures and more regulation. 91% in the US favor mandatory ESG disclosure. 84% of companies are not disclosing enough ESG information. That's what investors believe. And 87% believe that government should apply more pressure to enforce ESG compliance. Next slide. Investors are expecting net zero pledges. A lot of conversation around COP26 on this. In the next 12 months, investors expect companies in which they, have established, in which they invest to establish and communicate a plan to achieve net zero emissions, 94%. And 93% believe that companies have, that have articulated a net zero plan deserve a premium. Next slide. Majority are concerned uh, that companies will not be able to meet their net zero commitments, just like ESG, 79% globally and 92% in the US. Next slide. Here's an inter some interesting information. Employee activism signals a healthy workplace. Investors believe that employee activism is indicative of a healthy workplace culture, good leadership, and a highly engaged workforce. 74% globally, 72% globally, in the US. And if you look at this versus our data in 2019, where investors, 74% of global investors agree that companies with activist employees are less attractive investments. So a significant turnaround there. Next slide. Accountability for culture is at the board level. 71% agree that it's important for a board, director, a board of directors to be held accountable for maintaining a positive company culture. Next slide. 
So when we started thinking about activism and asking questions about activism, 95% of the 700 we surveyed are more interested in taking an activist approach to investing. And if you look at the bottom right of the slide, 74% would take an aggressive activist measure. So publicly uh, discussing concerns about the, about the company's strategy to enforce change. Next slide. And turning to retail, the retail investor, meme stocks are seen as a targeted attack against institutional investors. 89% in the US believe that meme stocks represent a targeted attack against them. Very interesting. Next slide. So what do you do to navigate all these changing investor priorities? First, approach ESG reporting with the same rigor as financial reporting. Two, develop a credible and evidence-based net zero plan and make sure it has board level accountability. Three, provide opportunities for employees to engage. Make sure there's a two-way conversation with employees and update them regularly on progress. Number four, make sure you're examining your long only shareholders and, and looking for trends related to activism. Very importantly, stay on top of shareholder proposal trends. There are more ESG proposals that were passed this last year than any other year on record. Make sure you understand what the trends are there. Number five, consider the role that retail investors play in your stock and have a plan around that. So now with all that information, why don't we turn it over to Simon and the panel? Thank you so much, Josh. Um, well, I want to say at the outset, this is an interactive session. We're gonna be welcoming questions from the audience throughout the panel. Um, so please do, you'll see a Q&A um, box or a Q&A um, icon at the bottom of your screen. Please do feel free to ask questions at any point and we'll be coming to them in due course. Um, so I'd like to um, start off, um, Tanya, by asking, asking you a question to do with one of the, the findings um, in this report. I've, by the way, just come back. I'm hot off the train a couple of days ago anyway from, from Glasgow, where I was for a couple of weeks during COP26. I think we all have COP26 on the brain. I'm sure we'll all have our own opinions as to what was achieved and what was not achieved at COP26. But certainly this is a really great time to be talking about these issues to do with climate change and the wider sustainability space. Um, so Tanya, the, the question that I'd like to, to ask you, um, and I think you're, you're really well placed to, to answer it in your, in your position at the world's biggest asset manager is the, this, I think it's the first slide actually, or the first major finding in the report saying, uh, do investors scrutinize or subject ESG to the same scrutiny as operational and financial considerations? So we've got 88% at the global level, 90% uh, in the US saying they do. Now, um, as a journal, as journalists, we're, we're a skeptical bunch. And so with, with, with surveys, we'll often think, well, people give the answer that they perceive to be the, the politically correct answer or the sort of socially acceptable answer, or whatever. And everyone knows these days that you are supposed to subject ESG to the same level of scrutiny as financial and operational factors. But is that really the case? And, and if it is, then, then why? What's, what's driving that? Well, thanks, Sam, and I appreciate the question. I'm glad to be here today. I, I would say this year in particular, we have uh, continued to request enhanced disclosure uh, from the companies uh, that we represent on behalf of our clients uh, and really asking for clarity around the way they are explicitly um, including, you know, their plans around clim their climate transition action plans. Um, so really asking companies to disclose how their business plan is aligned with the goal of limiting global warming to well below two degrees Celsius, consistent with achieving that net zero global GHG emissions reduction uh, by 2050. Uh, so really asking for clarity around what is the plan? How is it actionable? How is it factored in from a capital allocation perspective? How is that factored in from an R&D perspective? Um, so I would say they're intertwined. So not necessarily weighing one more than the other. Got it. Yeah, I mean, if, I, I think it's something which is which is changing. It has been changing. And, and Deborah, from your from your point of view, 
um, you've been in your current position, I think, for 22 years. Is that correct? Um, so, so that's that's an incredible perspective you've got of, of how this has shifted, because you can compare within the same job the sort of incentives that you're under, the pressures you're under, the way in which um, you've been doing your job and the way in which ESG um, has has risen, as I presume it, it has to some extent as, as a consideration for you. Could, could you talk us through how that's changed since 1999 from your perspective, and especially in terms of the interaction that you have with investors, as well as the interaction that you have with a, as an investor with, with entities that you invest in? Yes, well, I, I think I uh, uh, am exceeding the normal CEO tenure by, by several multiples at this point. And I can say that ESG wasn't in my lexicon when I became CEO at Ventus in 1999. What was in my lexicon that I grew up with was doing the right thing. And I often say, and I truly have believed that ESG is a, a fancy way of doing the right thing. But, and it has, and, and I think it came into my lexicon more than a decade ago. I would say within real estate, Ventus has been a leader in these areas and uh, a, took up the cause, if you will, uh, very early on, um, in part because we also believe it helps our business. And we've always believed that it would be if it even wasn't then, that it would be important to shareholders. So we've tried to stay ahead of the curve. Um, and it has obviously become much more sophisticated, much more highly structured, much better understood with a much higher level of engagement from an understanding and um, inquiry from our institutional shareholders. And so we've been happy that we've been ahead of the curve within real estate. And that's on each of the measures, environmental, um, social, and governance, where each of which we think is an important flank to success as a company and also risk management. Um, but it's it, the arc of ESG over this time period um, has, has been, I would say, very I think we just lost you at the end, Deborah. But I think I think we got the point that you're making. I mean, there's been a huge amount of changes um, during your your tenure. And um, Katrina, I'd like to come to you. Um, you've got a great perspective in in various ways, but I think in, one thing that I want to ask you about in particular is to do with the the regional differences um, that that we're seeing because you you look a lot at Europe, um, but you obviously have a great perspective on the US. As well, so one of the nice things about this report is we can see in various of the the elements of it, we can see it broken down across uh, geography. Um, so, from your point of view, if you compare just the US and, and Europe in particular, feel free to bring in other geographies too. And um, how do you see the differences in the ESG conversation, the conversations between investors and companies, and the wider ESG conversation? How does it compare on both sides of the Atlantic? Um, I would say firstly that um, the, the conversation did start in Europe, but it's quickly migrated across the transatlantic. So it's come into the United States very quickly. That's been driven by a few things. The first is that these are global companies. Um, and so they operate you know, in the US, they operate in Europe, they operate in Asia. So they can't just have a European ESG new, new set of standards for Europe in Europe. They need to have a global set of standards. So I think that it's the global nature of the these businesses. But I would say that from an investor perspective, it started in Europe. And as, as, as Deb, Deborah has said, you know, it, it has migrated into the um, into the US market in particular. Um, you know, I wanted to go back and, and, and from an investment point of view, I do think it's so important. You're hearing that the, the the ESG criteria has moved from just being an ESG set of criteria to being a business strategy. And I think that that's something that we've seen in, in all regions in terms of it's not just ESG for the sake of ESG, it's ESG for the sake of good business strategy. So people aren't just doing it to make themselves investable anymore or investable by ESG dedicated funds. They're doing it because it's the right thing to do. And I think that that speaks volumes to how important this is going forward. 
Thanks so much, Katrina. Um, Harlan, coming to you, um, so you're particularly focused on the G of ESG, the governance side in your role at MSCI, although of course they are inevitably always interlinked uh, with the E and the S as well. Um, what are the really interesting things that have been striking you in particular, let's say over the past year, because I feel like the conversation is, is moving on, you know, certainly year by year, if not month by month, um, we're seeing new developments coming. You know, we saw an incredible uh, activist challenge at ExxonMobil, for example. Um, what are the big things that people watching this this call what, who are dialing into this seminar really need to be alert to and should be looking out for over the months to come? So something that I think has been, you know, it really lies at the intersection of two of the big it, trends that, that, that are surfaced in this report, uh, action on climate change and, you know, investors taking a more uh, active stance, uh, making more use of engagement are uh, the say on climate votes that we've been seeing mostly, mostly in you know, Europe, but also piecemeal in, in North America. And you, listeners here in the, the U.S. will be familiar with say on pay as it was introduced under Dodd-Frank. It's a non-binding advisory vote on pay. Say on climate is similar, but there's a lot of is concern about whether that this is actually the right thing to do. Does this make sense? Is this actually an appropriate mechanism for holding the board accountable on issues like climate change, right? It, a lot of investors we've heard from have said, you know, we already have a perfectly serviceable way of doing that, which is voting against the board. Um, and that uh, this, you know, say on climate could actually uh, insulate uh, directors from the, you know those oppositional votes, and there's also the concern that a, a you know vote like this could be used uh, for a, a kind of greenwashing, where a company puts forward a sand climate vote, uh, gets majority support, maybe because investors are forgiving toward a company that's you know or, or complacent to the, toward a company that's you know taken this progressive stance, or that they maybe they don't have the sophisticated tools necessary to really dive into the climate plan yet. And the result is that this company can go forward you know, year after year with uh, saying we have shareholder endorsement uh, for this this climate strategy. Uh, but I think there is you know potentially a way for these uh, votes to you know, be effective going forward. And I think that involves you know, understanding how often shareholders are going to vote on a company's climate strategy and and mixing forward looking votes. You know what is the plan the board is putting forward? What are we what are what are our targets? Are they aligned with Paris? Are there, are we setting meaningful emissions targets? And backward looking votes in subsequent years. Is has management been as good of its word? Are we actually living up to these uh, these vote results? And and for anyone who's really interested in in say on climate in particular, we we at MSCI just launched a an interactive chart uh, this week this week that that breaks down all of the say on climate votes that have happened uh, this year and the ones that are scheduled for next year and plots them against a measure of a company's uh, uh, the strength of their climate strategy. So I encourage you to check that out too. Thanks so much, Alan. Um, we do, at the end of every year at the FT, we do the words of the year. And I'm pretty sure greenwashing is gonna be one of them this year. I mean, it, it's really been quite struck to me, even just in the past few months, the extent to which um, concerns about greenwashing have surged up the, the agenda. The British government's been talking about it. Uh, Antonio Guterres of the UN has been talking about it in speeches. And I think it's actually, if I were a CEO, I'd be really nervous about this. because I think the conversation is moving really fast. I think perhaps a couple of years ago, even companies would get credit for trying um, and for doing stuff that sounded green. And people would say, well, they're just starting. And so give them some credit for that. Give them a break. Now, personally, I would have said, well, the science on climate change has been clear since at least the 1980s, so you shouldn't just be starting now. But that's a whole other, <laughs> whole other question. Um, but, you know, it, it's, it's obviously something which I think now any CEO who's really paying attention is very alert to this. And so, Deborah, I'd love to get your perspective as the head of an S&P 500 company. Um, you know, I, I, I'm sure you're very, very alert to this conversation and you want to make sure that what you're delivering is real action, which is not going to be dismissed as greenwashing. How do you make sure that what you do is not just greenwashing? Yes, thank you. I, look, I, I think the point was made by Katrina and others that integrating all of these ESG principles and values through the company's business decision making is the best way to both move the needle and, and also uh, avoid kind of what you want to call greenwashing. Um, I would say that uh, authenticity and also customizing what you're doing to the type of business you're in are also really important. The benefit of having started earlier, as you say, Simon, is that we have been collecting 
all of the environmental data for a long time. We understand our carbon footprint really well. We have had a carbon emissions reduction goal that is validated by the science-based targets. We've, we've been working on those goals and increasingly auditing and publishing our progress against those goals and have received third-party validation like Energy Star certifications in our buildings. Um, so, so investors can see that progress and then we are gonna build on that to establish a net carbon zero goal that again is both, we want ambitious goals, but we want attainable goals and a, a, a very distinct plan of attack that we can share with investors and our employees who care about it as well and begin to measure our progress. And if we do that and communicate our substantive goals and achievements, in an auditable, clear way, I think that is the best way to ensure that we're moving the needle and people understand that it's authentic and real. Thanks so much, Deborah. Yeah, I think it's it's really interesting to just think about what companies are trying to do and also the the, the forces that are acting on the companies to give them the right incentives. Um, and Tanya, I'd like to come to you on that. So we, we wrote an FT, Big read, um, a colleague, uh, Andrew Edgecliffe Johnson and I last week, um, looking at the role of the private sector in, in tackling climate change. And there was a great um, quote in there, quite a disturbing quote for me. Um, I interviewed the uh, CEO of Munich Re, the, the leading global reinsurance company. And he said that in, in, in private conversations that he would have with some other big global uh, CEOs, he said he would hear people saying, well, the governments are not taking action, so the private sector has to take action. And he said it, it's almost like we need to take over from the government. And the way he said that, you know, you, you can read that sentence in various ways, but the way he said it is clearly something that he felt very uncomfortable with. The idea that, you know, the elected representatives are not doing their jobs, so we have unelected people who are sort of stepping in. And it's uncomfortable because I think the motivations of all involved, as far as I'm aware, are good. Um, but if you have a situation where the private sector is, uh, and you know, particularly, particularly big uh, financial companies, principally BlackRock is taking on a very influential role. Um, and some, some people are uncomfortable with that. I think a lot of people within the financial sector are saying, this isn't really our job <laughs> you know, to be effectively shaping um, the global response to climate change. That's really the job of governments. So how, how do you feel about that um, within BlackRock? So I think you know, as far as I can see, you know, big financial companies, including, including yours, have said, well, look, everyone should do what they can. We're going to do what we can. But is there a risk of the uh, conversation being excessively shaped by big companies when governments are not being proactive enough? Well, I think it's just, you know, a huge um, topic for all of us to tackle, right? And so to the extent that from our perspective, climate risk is investment risk. So we take it from that perspective and therefore sustainability is a key component of our investment approach. So that's why we're asking companies to have clear policies and action plans to manage that climate risk and to realize the opportunities, you know, presented with this global energy transition. Um, but it's going to take all parties. It's going to take public companies, private companies, and governments uh, to work together to achieve these goals. So, you know, I understand in the in the survey, there's skepticism around everyone achieving these goals, um, but we all are going to have to kind of move in the same direction, uh, which is why we're advocates for convergence around these frameworks, um, so we can be clear about what it is we're all aiming for and measuring collectively. Um, so I, I think it's just going to take everyone's effort to achieve these goals, because it's one planet, so we need to work on it together. And, and Simon, if, if I may, and, and, and for the investors too, I think the last two years um, have really shown the power of the investment community and of leaders of corporations because there has been a vacuum in a lot of these principle-based and risk-based uh, matters like 
um, racial justice and other areas. And I have been impressed and somewhat maybe pleasantly surprised at the leadership that has been shown by the investment community and by um, uh, corporations in filling that void in a pretty constructive way by and large and in a way that has has been you know values based and I think we all realize it is good risk management we have to live in one world that it, it is not warming and we have to live in a society that perhaps is more you know fair and just and I've been impressed by the way um financial firms and corporations have taken on taken this on in a very constructive way. It's a sea change in my in my lifetime. Yeah, I think it's been really interesting. I mean, the, the, the conversation around that, it was, it was a big thing in Glasgow in particular. Um, and so Al Gore, when he was in Glasgow, yeah, he was talking a lot about the need to see, to not, not treat the climate crisis in isolation from other challenges that we face, including what he calls hyper inequality. So he feels strongly that we need to ensure a more equitable distribution of, of income and wealth. You know, obviously the trends of the last 30 years has been, if you're 50% and below in the income distribution, you've been going like that. And if you're top 10%, it's like this. And top 1%, it's like that. And top 0.1%, it's vertical <laughs> or thereabouts. So he would say that you have to address those things at the same time. Um, and... And so that, I think, is one of the reasons for, for concern about just the alignment of interests um, between, you know, big corporate leaders and the rest of the population of Western nations, let alone most of the world where people are on a few thousand dollars a year or, or less. Right. Um, but, but I think, it's, you know, that conversation about the role of the, um, the government and regulators and the role of the private sector is getting really, really live now. I think it's it's you know, the past few months, um, again, it seems to be rising in importance. And Harlan, from your point of view, looking at corporate governance, what's your take if, and, and this is almost quite a sort of philosophical question, uh, so feel free to answer it how you see fit, but if we're to you know, maximize the positive impacts of companies, how far do you think we want investors to be driving that change, you know, activist investors, um, or just through normal, more normal, conventional sorts of investor engagement? Or how far do you think actually we need to update um, the regulations um, that, that are surrounding uh, corporate governance? Yeah, I think, I think there's, there's you know, investors and boards need to really look at, at every level of every lever available to them to, to get change at all of these uh, issues. Um, to just like, if you just want to focus on one, one particular challenge which is you know the, the the search for for getting to net zero um portfolios which we you know is, is a, a big concern uh, that we've been hearing about from investors and when we've been trying to meet um you know one of the one of the there, there's there's all different uh uh you know methods of getting to that goal one is reallocating your capital to you know lower carbon opportunities but that you know, our research shows that uh, you know, 90% of listed companies are, are not on an emissions pathway that's aligned with you know, 1.5 degrees warming, right? So, so that alone doesn't get you uh, to, to a, a proper carbon transition. You also need to look to get engagement and active stewardship. Um, and, and that involves working with boards and, and you know, working with them to, to find new businesses and find new opportunities to, to transform businesses. Uh, it also comes down to financing low cost uh, or low carbon solutions and, and new ways to you know, help solve these problems on a global basis. And, and you know, finally, of course, is you know, working on policy advocacy working with, with governments, uh, with regulators, and with uh, investors, I think, working with, with companies as well and getting them to, to use their, their influence, their, their, their clout uh, for, the, for the best interest of the whole market. Thanks. Yeah, so the, um, Katrina, coming to you next. Um, and by the way, I don't want to monopolize all the questions here. We, ne we need more audience questions, please. So please keep them coming in. Um, Katrina, the, the, um, the tagline of this report um, being yeah, the trust barometer and, and just looking at some of the findings, it seems like trust is in fairly short supply, actually, as far as um, the trust that investors say they have for, for companies. And perhaps that's a healthy thing. It depends on how you define trust and so on. But what, what's your take? How would you describe the approach that you take towards the companies that your firm invests in? How far do you trust them 
um, to do the right thing? How far do you think there actually needs to be, you know, more transparency um, and more accountability? Um, I think we see our role as very much, I call it the trusted shareholder advisor to companies. So we, we see a partnership here, but I think that we all need to be specific about the roles that we each play. You know, we play a role as an investor and companies play a role as CEOs and as corporates. Um, you know, we always talk to companies because they, you know, as as, as the CEO of a company, um, Deborah can opine on this, you have the right to tell us what you're focusing on and what you want to be measured by. Um, may, it usually is contained in the, the executive comp plan. What are your targets and how you get there? I, as an investor, can take those targets, be they three-year, five-year, 10-year targets, and I can work out how those impact the valuation of the company. And I can make an assessment what the fair value of the company is. Is it trading at a discount to that fair value? And then make an investment decision as an investor. I'm, I then also, however, have the right to speak to the CEOs and to monitor the progress that they're making making against those targets over time, you know, having a look at the interim goals and the achievement of that. As it relates to ESG, what we're increasingly seeing is part of the executive's compensation is being increasingly tied to ESG targets. Um, we've seen different ways of that happening, be it a percentage of their compensation is directly tied to achievement of certain, uh, certain metrics, or there's a kind of qualifier where, you know, you may meet 100% of your targets, but if you don't do it in an ESG-friendly way, you get hit by like a 20% redu reducer, basically. So there's different ways that companies can implement it. Um, in terms of the, you know, the willingness and the trust between corporates. I think that, you know, we're very far away from I think, the scandals of the past. I think that investors need to trust the management teams because we're giving them capital and we're giving them capital to invest and earn a return that exceeds the cost of capital. And then that return comes back to our shareholders and then, you know, gives them that financial stability and, and, and achieving their goals and their financial goals. So I don't think, I think that while, you know, people will are very quick to say, I don't trust Trust management teams, if you actually look at, they're quick to speak about a lack of trust, but generally speaking, I would say most of the investment teams that we have capital allocated to, um, or our investment teams have allocated it to companies, we trust the CEOs of those companies and we trust them to be good stewards of that capital. Thanks so much. Um, coming to you, Tanya, um, looking at some of the interesting findings from this report, um, one of the questions in the report is on whether a company with strong ESG performance deserves a premium valuation to its share price. Uh, yes, say 92% of respondents from around the world. Um, so A, do you agree? 92% chance you do. <laughs> um, but if so, why? I mean, there are all sorts of reasons why you might say this, you know, if a company has good ESG, then um, good ESG performance, then it deserves a premium valuation. But but why is that exactly? Why would you actually say that it's worth paying more? What are the specific reasons for that? Well, I think the market uh, dictates the premium uh, on a particular stock, but on the whole, um, we're looking at sustainability through the lens of financial resilience. And so to the extent that investors believe that companies are making the right decisions in terms of assessing those long-term risks that are material to that company and therefore taking those actions that will and reinforce financial resilience over time, they're allocated cap capital to those companies. So I think it's really just that feedback loop of enhanced disclosure, really progressing and making progress against the goals that you've set for the longer term um, builds that confidence over time for investors. And so they're allocating those capital and therefore creating the premium. Thanks so much. We've, we've got some really good questions coming in from the, from the audience. Please do keep them coming and we'll try to address as many of them as we can in the time available to us. Um, Harlan, one, one for you to do with um, employee activism. This is one thing that was interesting for me in Glasgow. I met some young French people in their 20s who were activists, they're working for big French companies or, or big international companies in France. One of them was working for BCG, for example, and they were saying, well, you know, um, this is how we're going to try and make change. You know, they can't fire us. So we're going to try and you know, do as much as we can. Well, they can't fire us for just voicing our opinions. We're going to try and push this company on the right track. So when it comes to governance of companies, how much of an influence do you think is now 
um, being felt from employees. And could you talk us through, I mean, how is that being felt? Is it in particular the youngest employees at companies? What sort of things are happening? Is it in certain parts of the world? Uh, do, do you think it's significant? I think it has the potential to be. I think like like just about everything in governance, you have to be, uh, give a big qualifying, it depends, uh, depending on the company and the situation. But uh, I think that uh, this is a great example where the nitty gritty dynamics of how the board interacts with the management team, interacts with you know the, the executives down the C-suite. It's all really important how the, how information flows throughout the organization and, and what kind of picture the board is able to get and what what kind of you know culture permeates through from from top to bottom and you know the the, the trends that we're seeing around employee activism are great uh, it, potentially a, a great example of how for lack of a better word i don't know if it's really the right one but kind of grassroots within the employee the the, the, the workforce activism can change a company's culture um i don't know that that we're going to see uh, a, a, you know, the, the kind of a revolution that, that the, the advocates themselves might be hoping for. I think that there is, uh, you know, a fair bit of uh, uh, conservatism towards some of these ideas in, in boardrooms. And I think that in a lot of cases, that's what you're paying directors for, to take a very risk oriented approach to a lot of these issues. Uh, but it's certainly a, the, the interplay between those two forces is something that we're, you know, we're watching very carefully and, uh, and, and curious to see how it plays out, especially, you know, as we go forward into the next uh, proxy season. To throw that to, to Deborah, actually, along a similar, similar, uh, similar track to do with employees, do you feel under pressure from your employees? Do you really, do you hear a lot from them saying this is how we want the company to be behaving? Well, we hope that we are always leading and that the company that the employees are proud to be associated with Ventas because of our leadership and values based decision making. I would say recently um, it, it has been almost table stakes to to be a leader to get, to recruit new employees. And we have seen bubbling up some additional grassroots. Um, enthusiasm for various areas. Certainly net zero is one, which obviously we're already well progressed on, but there are others. Um, I would say as a CEO, we do have a lot of stakeholders and uh, there, is, there, is a, there is a component of the employee workforce that is on the other side of these issues. And so really the hardest part of our job is managing uh the right way for the right purposes and balancing uh the desires of many stakeholders including different shareholders want different things europeans want certain things us-based shareholders others and the same thing among employees so there the art of it all i think is being principled being clear um and making sure you are managing with a, 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 an understanding of all your stakeholders, because everyone is not on the same page as to certain of these items. But I love the activism and engagement of employees and, and think it's a real benefit. Yeah, it was quite striking for me in Glasgow in particular, not only these employees I mentioned, but obviously, you know, um, other young people who were there in Glasgow, members of Fridays for Future, um, just the level of, they had a, a much higher bar or a much higher sights for what they considered to be possible. Um, and I felt, you know, people my age and above were, were less, um, you know, were more inclined to use phrases like politically impossible or politically unrealistic. People in their twenties don't tend to use those phrases, I found. But to <laughs> capture that and benefit from it, while also, you know, understanding the possible. Yeah. But, but use it for the benefit of, of the company and oh. the, 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 broader, the broader world. So that, that's a fun part and that's the art of it. I suppose it's a matter of taking advantage of the enormous number of creative minds you have within the company coming up with ideas and treating that as a resource to be to be used. Yeah, I think I think that's right. Um, a question I'd like to throw to Katrina um, from the audience. 
to do with, well, the question is, what, what do you think companies and asset management firms need most from ESG technology solutions? And that's something I've been thinking about a lot, in particular when it comes to assessment ratings. How, how, how do you assess um, when you're looking at a very large number of companies, um, you're not able to look at all of them and, you know, the exhaustive up close detail that you might want to if you're dealing with a large number of companies. So you rely perhaps on third party assessments or assessments that, that are done by analysts within your organization. Um, how do you assess a company's performance on sustainability and what sort of things as this um, audience member has asked? What could be most useful to you in terms of ratings, offerings or technology offerings in the future? Um, so we have a number of different layers to this. First of all, we have a, an overarching ESG council, um, which is comprised from each of our investment managers, has an ESG ambassador, supporting those ambassadors are their dedicated ESG analysts. Those analysts are working in conjunction with the investment teams. Um, and I think that that's where the intersection is because the ESG analyst is looking at the collection of dedicated standardized metrics by industry. Because you know, if you look at, for example, the cement, industry, which emits, you know, half a ton of emissions for every ton of cement they produce, you know, their, their targets for getting down the emissions of that may be different for than a Google or something, for example. So we need to be industry specific when we're looking at these. Um, and then we, so we work with the, the, the dedicated analyst partners with our investment teams. In terms of the information, I feel like in ESG, it's a wealth of information and a poverty of attention. I think there are so many different metrics that we have available to us and it is just focusing on those ones which will make a difference and I think Tanya comes back to it, and I think it's such a relevant point is we need to be specifically focused on those metrics which have financial or business risk because you know as an analyst that's what we need to be very cognizant of as we model out the future cash flows and the future of these companies is understanding which of these metrics are going to be most impactful and that finally kind of finishes up the circle and it's why you know companies need to focus on this because you know if they're focusing on the most important metrics from an ESG point of view. They're creating a sustainable cash flow. They're going to drive higher shareholder returns and we're all going to be happy. So I do think that there's a degree of symbi you know, symbiotic, you know, everyone working together to achieve the greater good. But there are also tensions, aren't there? I mean, and this is actually, there's a couple of audience questions that we've had along these lines, which I'd like to bring you in on, Tanya. Um, looking at, well, as, as one um, audience member put it, how would the panel balance their interest in ESG progress and performance with their interest in strong financial results? It, you know, it could take you know, capital investments over a long period of time that would never to be eaten into profits. And I, and I think that's that's just true. I mean, profit and purpose are not perfectly aligned. I mean, in some case, you know, you can make money from solar energy. You can also still, in some cases, make money from coal. There was a small cap offering um, in London recently for a, for a, a smallish coal project. I think it was five or six times oversubscribed. So clearly a lot of people are very excited about the opportunity to make money from thermal coal. Right. So, so you, you, it, it's simply not the case that the, the alignment between saving the planet and, and making money is, is, is perfect. Right. Um, so so how, how do you deal with that that tension? Because sometimes um, sometimes there is a certain a certain tension there where perhaps to achieve maximum impact at the social or environmental level, it might mean leaving money on the, on the, on the table. Um, under the current framework within which we operate. So, so how, how, how do you approach that as a, as a company that wants to have a positive impact, but also has an imperative to make money for its investors? Well, I think some companies have really found that balance. So to the extent that they are implementing projects that are moving them forward in terms of their carbon reduction plans are actually cost savings. They result in you know, either lower cost in terms of shipping, lower cost in terms of transportation costs. So I think they're not necessarily mutually exclusive. And to the extent that there are other stakeholders that benefit that actually create a positive feedback loop into the company, whether that's improving their license to operate in a given community or include increases their, uh, you know, a feature as a company of um, best place to work um, really enhances their ability to recruit and retain talent. I think there are other elements that may not show up on the balance sheet that are actually beneficial to the company longer term in terms of that broader definition of financial resilience. So we may not see it in a given quarter. And again, we're long-term investors. Um, you know, we're taking a long-term view. 
it's not quarter by quarter. It's like really is this investment in people, investment in technology going to be enhancing the company and the enterprise overall for the longer term? So I think we need to take a broader perspective on that. What's your take on it, Deborah, in terms of the the pressures? We've been talking about the pressures that a CEO would come under from investors to move faster in, in tackling environmental issues, for example. Um, but it can also go the other way, of course. I mean, someone I caught up with in Glasgow was Emmanuel Faber, who was the former CEO of Danone, um, who tried to move in very ambitious ways towards greater sustainability. And... Uh, and yeah, you know, investors. I think that you know they were pushed back about uh, on various things, but certainly some investors pushed back very strongly because they felt that he was he was going too far too fast. Um, so there's also you know if if you want to go with something incredibly ambitious agenda to to be much much more sustainable very quickly, you will get pushed back from some investors. I mean that's inevitable. So how far do you feel that actually for you and for other S&P 500 CEOs, you may actually in some respects be somewhat constrained by the fact that some investors don't want to move very, very fast and, and very, very far? Um, if I Thank you for that question. I, I, I just want to say three things, and two of them really build on what Tanya said. So a, a lot of our efforts on sustainability are energy saving uh, uh, pro capital projects at our properties, which both reduce consumption and are profitable. So those are the easy ones, right? Those are the ones you figure out where the Venn diagram overlaps and you just attack those as quickly as possible and you get universal support for them. There are others that are uh, different. And I would tell you among our 1200 properties, we house 75,000 seniors. And in the case of the, the pandemic, we put all of our resources behind keeping seniors and workers safe. And as we have been elevating out of the pandemic, we were early adopters of the vaccine requirement for the workers in the buildings. Obviously, we vaccinated 75,000 seniors at the, at the, when the vaccine was first available, saving many, many lives. And that was incredible, but we, we're early adopters of a vaccine requirement for the workers as a moral imperative, okay? And that cost us money. And it cost us money in the short term because some people left the workforce and we had to cover for those workers in different ways. But this is a matter of timing, right? Because over the long term, I think we're managing risk and reputation and we're a better company and our communities are better communities as a result. And that, that may be less profitable in the short term, but I think has a very discernible intermediate term positive value for investors. And then getting to the third point in your question, I mean, really, as companies, we make very difficult balancing decisions uh, in what we do. And so when that's why we haven't announced a net zero yet, we are working on it, building on the carbon uh, reduction, uh, emission reduction work we have been doing. But we want to make sure it's as close as possible to that Venn diagram overlap where we can, it is ambitious, but it is, is beneficial and doesn't go too far, too fast in tipping over because it will be less likely we'll be able to achieve it because there will be stakeholders who say, wait a minute, Debbie, performance is still number one with me. And so balancing those, balancing short-term, intermediate-term, long-term, we still have to perform. So we want to get to that optimal point where we are still performing and we're therefore a company most likely to achieve our goal and we want to set that goal at the right, most ambitious point, but one that will garner the greatest support from most of our stakeholders. So that's how we think about it. Thanks so much, Deborah. Um, Harlan, question for you, um, really interesting one um, from the audience. Um, is MSCI evaluating corporate culture? It's a really interesting question in the sense that you know, it, it speaks to and asks how you approach this, really. How far are you looking for, you know, specific 
metrics um, or how far are you really trying to build a sense of how a company how a company operates and what what its culture is like how, how do you approach that great question uh, I would say on the the, the company culture side the, you know, the whole workforce we I, I, I would challenge you to find someone who can't actually measure culture per se but what we can measure is uh, the the consequences of culture I think so looking at things like turnover in the workforce looking at um, the, the, the the opportunities that uh, that we can see from disclosure uh, that, that that are measurable that that suggest that a company is making this a place that people want to work where where uh, human capital is is something that's that's prized and, and something uh, that's enhanced. Uh, and and you know, the, the, we look at both the risks there and, and the opportunities that, that companies could be taking advantage of. Uh, and so that's that's on the, the, the side of the whole um, organization. And we also, you know, from uh, let's not forget the, the board culture, right, which is a you know, corporate governance focus is, is something that I, I look at very closely. Um, so, you know, what's what's the you know, the level of independence in the boardroom. Is this a board that has uh, a lot of industry experts on it? Is this a board with, you know, financial expertise on it? And, you know, these are these are skills rather than, than you know, cultural aspects per se, but they, they I think, contribute to, um, you know, how the board is likely to approach its work, how the board is likely to um, uh, respond to, to challenges. And, you know, thinking about the ownership structure of a company as well, right? Is this uh, a controlled company? with a number of family members of the controlling shareholder on the board, things like that. How does that play into, and how does that trickle down uh, through the rest of the organization? So that, those are all things that we're looking at and, and how we interpret culture, I think. It's really interesting, thanks. Um, Katrina, one, one I wanna to throw to you, we've got a couple of questions from audience members asking about what, what you guys make of the rise of the retail investor, as well as of course the meme stock um, stories that we saw already this year. And, Actually, there's a couple of um, quite interesting sections of the reports, um, so to do with Wall Street bets on, on Reddit, for example. Does Wall Street bets and other online communities and do these influence your investment decisions? 87% of respondents said yes, interestingly. 90% think that these and other online communities can create false markets. Um, and then meme stocks represent a targeted attack against institutional investors like myself or my firm 84 percent globally and 89 percent in the us say that they are under attack um katrina are you are you under attack um how how how, how are uh, you know wall street bets and meme stocks you know retail investors who and it's and it's it, it reflects a more serious um issue of course which is that many people who don't consider themselves winners of the current economic setup mm -hmm. um, are very angry about this and they want uh, to mobilize in ways even at great risk to their own personal finances to launch a sort of financial attack on those who they consider to be bringing the system against them and so on so it's, it's, it's a very it's a very interesting and important story in many ways but of course, we were all gripped by um, the GameStop story and the, the broad GameStop story earlier this year. What, what takeaways, what, what lessons did you personally draw from that? Um, in terms of you know, when my cab driver is talking about like the investment portfolio that they're managing, I, I, I start to wonder, I mean, my day job is to analyze companies, um, to understand their position, their competitive advantage, you know, where they're generating their cash flows and everything. And I was thinking about my cab driver, he's driving a cab all day. So when is he getting the time to do that in-depth, detailed research that results in an investment recommendation? The second thing, if I could change any word that, was, that needed to be eliminated from investor vernacular, it's betting. We are not at a casino betting our shareholders' capital. That's not the way we think about it. We look at risk. We look at return. We do outcome modeling. We do so much work to make sure that we are not acting as though we're in a casino betting you know, our clients' capital. And why is that important? Because I keep coming back to you know, one of the greatest goods the investment management industry can do is to ensure financial stability for the investors in its funds. I mean, that's just such a great goal in terms 
terms of you know giving people retirement security, giving people the security to know that they can afford a college education, or giving them the security to know that their savings for a deposit on a house will not be wiped out with one bad bet on GameStop that goes down 50%. Um, you know, because these stocks went up and down. Um, and the, the thing that also we need to be aware is a lot of a number of these investors or what they're calling themselves investors, um, you know, were making very volatile bets. Um, and, and a number of them were doing it with margin. And I mean, you know, if you do it with margin, you're still on the hook for the capital. Um, as we say, if you short a stock, people don't understand that there's unlimited downside um, versus if you go long a stock, your downside is just the capital you put in. So I just think that, you know, it's not that I don't think there's some very smart investors in those meme stocks. I think that there are a few, but if you look at who they're competing with on the institutional side and you look at what we do and the amount, I mean, you know, people, CEOs will tell you how many questions do we ask them about their business? And you know, Tanya and Deborah can all opine, you know, we do so much work that I'm just necess not necessarily sure all of those meme stock investors are doing. So unfortunately, we're almost out of time. We have time for one more question, which I'd like to throw to Tanya. Um, as I mentioned, we're, we're fresh out of COP26. It was, it was meant to be an important conference. Um, we, did, we did get some announcements from it, of course. A lot of people are very disappointed by it. What, in your opinion, I think we're all still sort of unpacking it and understanding the implications, but just at this early stage, what do you think could be the financial Im implications, the implications for investors and the wider economy from, from what we saw over the past couple of weeks in Glasgow? Well, to your point, I think we're all trying to really digest um, what was what we share, what we experienced. Um, but, you know, looking ahead, you know, we're focused on really monitoring how companies are, are going to explain and articulate their climate transition action plans. Um, really trying to dig into which elements to the earlier points made are aspirational versus really practical and really can be applied in the short term and interim term. So really hoping for more transparency as we go into 2022, more clarity around these plans and hopefully progress, material progress over the next year and years to come. And Deborah, from, from your point of view, um, the COP26 and, and the wider um, climate conversation at the moment. Do you have the feeling that things are picking up pace? Because there are so many different interpretations of um, uh, of COP26, and it was quite an extraordinary event. I mean, you had you know all sorts of you know many of the most powerful people in the world all jetting into one place and milling around, talking to each other, coming out with some some big sounding announcements, which were often very thin on you know concrete implementation detail. So do you feel like it's moved us forward? Do you think it's changed the environment within which you operate as the head of a big company? I would say that this is this is just one moment in an in, in, in otherwise irreversible uh, momentum toward you know increased sustainability activities by private industry and focused on by our stakeholders. It, probably move the ball forward, but maybe not as far as many of us uh, expected. But this is a trend that is is large. It's accelerating, as you say, it is is irreversible. And so I just view it as the the, the river is moving. It's one one moment in time and we're going to continue to focus on uh, becoming a more sustainable company, both environmentally as well as 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 from a from a cash flow and and uh, operational standpoint. And so that's how I I look at uh, the conference. I wish I had been there milling about with you. <laughs> yeah, it, it was an extraordinary thing. I think um, you know the, the the bottom line is by any measure we are on track for levels of climate change that will result in the loss of large numbers of lives, uh, the loss of large numbers of livelihoods, the devastation of entire communities. And with every 0 0.1 degrees C above 1.5, um, that's more lives lost, that's more communities devastated. Um, so, so from that point of view, I think, you know, it has to be seen as a disappointment. I think it was seen as a, as a success by people who 
have rather low expectations of what people can achieve when they put their heads together and you know people who focus on what is politically unrealistic and politically impossible might have been pleasantly surprised um i think there are many other people who think well actually didn't we put a man on the moon 50 years ago aren't we capable of doing better here um so that's a whole other debate which if we had another hour we could get into um unfortunately we are out of time um but thank you very much to all the all the panelists and to all the audience members especially those who asked some of those wonderful questions and uh hope to see you all again before too long thank you very much Thanks. thank you thank you to the panelists and thanks for the participants and more to come from uh the trust barometer take care thanks so much thanks